I'm delighted that um, you do this with Carol Prentice, um, who will be starting out, so I'm going to introduce her. But uh, we just kind of picked up and did a little bit more about, thought we'd start up doing a little bit more about Wilcox. <laughs> And it turned out to be, thanks to Carol's sleuthing, um, an amazing amount more than we thought we would. And first had it come out in three parts in Sage Notes, and then I gave a shortened version of this uh, Botany 2023, and then we decided to do an expanded version. And you get to see it now. But um, Carol was originally going to do the whole thing. She's been having trouble with um, recovering from bronchitis, but she'll start out before then I'll step in and take over. Um, Carol Prentice, uh, for those of you who don't know, was actually one of the founding members of the Holby and the first chapter president. So uh, <laughs> well, we have royalty in our net. <laughs> um, she um, escaped Filer and went to College of Idaho, um, at Packard student for a long time, um, worked for Fish and Game for most of her career, was first woman, you know, in the CO and, you know, position. Um, Worked in the lab on a lot of uh, forensic biology. I remember the smell of the boiling cooter skulls in particular. <laughs> and uh, well, she's been slicing open teeth and to age them, but uh, she can tell you all about that stuff. <laughs> um, I actually spent some time working one summer, a couple of summers fishing game with her too on the winter range in Ventura. So we've been keeping in touch. And she's been working on historical stuff fascinating and um so thinking giving her something to sink her teeth in um it's amazing what you managed to come up with so carol i'll let you take over and if you stand for the camera to see you oh. <laughs> you may have to show me which button to push oh sorry yeah um so if you just do this one i think oh, to go okay. forward or down either one okay all right and so uh when the holy first started Dr. Packard, the, over at the Herbarium at the College of Idaho, she came up with these names that she wanted to know who these people were. <clears throat> and one of them was Wilcox, and one was Mulford. And I took Mulford, and Billy Farley, if you know her, she took Wilcox, and she did some initial research on him. But this was back in the late 70s, and there was no internet. And it was really hard to find stuff. So I would write letters off to find out about Mulford. And Billy did different things to find out about Wilcox. And uh, and then as time went on, Billy, you know, shared her stuff with me. And then, then the internet came along and we could find all this stuff. So it was great. But... Uh, Billy Farley's name should be up here too because she did some of the initial work. Huh. Okay. Why is this not working to advance? <laughs> okay. Uh sorry. I had to, okay. yeah, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, now yeah. I right. just had to get the arrow on this screen instead of up there. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, Wilcox is the first collector of one of our primroses. And Mary Hallick Foote heard about this. And if you don't know who Mary Hallick Foote is, well, that's a talk for another time. <laughs> but, um, I love how she said, she wrote she wrote this, I think, in a letter, said it's a flower said to have been discovered by a surgeon at the barracks some years ago, a new flower, but I wonder if it's true. And we'll, you'll see, we're still wondering if it's true. <laughs> and uh, so it was, uh, it was named for him by, Supposedly named by him, but it was just kind of in the lore yeah. rather than. <laughs> but but it wasn't. It, it was. I'll get into that. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, so so we have this plant, and it's kind of in limbo, and uh, but we know it was collected by him when he he was here. Okay. Did I go backwards? No. Okay. 
Uh, there was no previous uh, biography known of him and until we started doing our in-depth research and found all kinds of wonderful things. So he was born in 1840 in New York and he went to Union College. And uh, like many in the Civil War, he, he got sick with typhoid fever. And so uh, he recovered and he went to medical school and then he came back and re-enlisted in the military as a surgeon. And this is the Civil War is still going on uh, during this time. And one of his assignments was to watch over Jefferson Davis. Uh, being the, the uh, Confederate president, they didn't want him to die. And he was very despondent, of course, after they lost the war. If he died, he would be a martyr. So they had to really take care of him. Mm -hmm. So they gave Dr. Wilcox this job. And at first he wasn't doing so well and then he started to recover. So after the Civil War, he, um, he, he stayed in the military and he uh, joined the cavalry and he would go to, he was assigned to different forts. And uh, these fort, forts were part of the West. They were mainly uh, to discourage Indian problems. And with that, I'm going to turn it back. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, I kind of got more intrigued in this part, too, because it's an overlooked period in the history of the exploration of the West, this period of these um, frontier forts. And um, yes, it was the, you know, conquering of the West by whatever version you want to do. Um, and yes, it dealt with the subjugation and displacement of the indigenous tribes, though there's an excellent book um, but anyhow, there was just a nature's army book that has to do with the soldiers in Yosemite and that really points out how the army, rather than just being the bad guys, was in many ways caught in between. Um, and it's just as I don't know, can't make this on me. Okay. <laughs> um, and we're often having to protect the Indians from the whites as the other way around. I mean, it's kind of different from our <laughs> standard way. And it's always, there's always so many more facets, multifaceted than we understand. So, um, and medical personnel like Wilcox, it was particularly in a multifaceted role. Um, and just so you know, the, you know, for those of you who didn't know, the tribes in the place we're sitting now, standing and sitting now was the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute mostly. But, um, you know, they'd travel around. <laughs> um, but anyhow, just this bit about the status of the medical personnel. Um, this one of the things that they're all tracked down was this buffalo robe in the Smithsonian Institution which was given to General Wilcox by a tribe grateful for the recovery of one of the young men under his treatment. So he was actually, you know, treating the Indians as well and they would thank him for it. <laughs> um, okay, but he was also at all these different postings that he was at. Uh, we haven't fully researched them. Uh, but definitely at least Oklahoma, Idaho, Nebraska, Arizona, and Alaska. Um, as well as, you know, all sorts of, he was posting around. I mean, it wasn't just Idaho, um, but he collected natural history items. He took out all of these postings and would send them back to the Smithsonian Institution because that's where the army had always been sending its natural history collections. And he uh, corresponded with established featured naturalists like Watson um, in particular, um, joined the Pretoria Botanical Club. Um, so he even knows posted out in the far frontier was, you know, an active part of the uh, natural history scene. Uh, so why was a medical doctor interested in botany? Well, the answer is 
is that plants were your pharmacopoeia. Um, you know, you got your willow bark for aspirin, opium for pain relief, quinine, malaria, fox glove. And um, one of the smaller articles or secondhand references to Wilcox um, was that he was reporting on Arizona plants that agave serves good for muscular rheumatism, uh, Jotropha as a cathartic. Um, and one can guess, well, he might have gotten this information from the indigenous people there. Um, so um, a lot more name for him than just from Idaho. In fact, most stuff is not from Idaho. Um, we've tracked down the ascidian, a couple of fungi. Uh, the Alocaria is uh, from the Boise time, but that's just now in the synonymy of Plagiobothus leptoplatus. Um, well, let's see, a few things are still the same. Panicum wilcoxianum is still a wilcoxianum in different genus. Uh, Berberus wilcoxii. There's even the cactus genus wilcoxia. So he made an impact. And in addition to things named after him, these are the species that he collected types or syntypes for. So again, quite a productive guy. <laughs> um, okay, and then just going through where was he? Uh, you, you know, we know he was in Camp Supply in modern day Oklahoma from at least 1875 to 78. Um, this was established in what was then Indian Territory. It's now Fort Supply Historic Site. Um, and in Featherly's Cavalcade of Botanists in Oklahoma, it just has this very brief little bit about he collected several hundred species of plants in what is now Western Oklahoma from 75 to 77. Um, details have not been found. <laughs> um, and he sent the, they sent them to Alfonso Wood. I don't know how he got in touch with Alfonso Wood, who was an active member of the Tory Botanic Club in New York. Um, I think he was a teacher at Brooklyn College or something. Um, Anyhow, so here's uh, types of a couple of the things that he collected uh, while during his time in Camp Supply, Townsendia and Grindelia. Um, so after that, maybe with some other, and I think he did go directly from Camp Supply to Boise, Fort Boise. Um, so this is not the Fort Boise that was the fur trader camp on the uh, mouth of the Boise River, but rather uh, the military outpost built in 1863, just you know, a mile from here, uh, after gold was discovered in the Boise Basin and Hawaii Mountains. Um, and it's constructed where kind of, um, the toll road coming down overall Bothy Summit, um, down Rocky Canyon, um, coming out through uh, Cottonwood Creek, um, and where that emerged from the mountains is where they built the fort. Uh, it made sense if the main road going to Idaho City was going up in the mountains over El Bafi Summit to put the fort right there at the base. Um, and you can, well, I won't wander over and point there. Uh, but yeah, it shows the toll road paralleling Cottonwood Creek coming down, meeting Freestone Creek, Creek then the, already had the canal going off that way. And uh, the plat. Where did that map come from? Um, actually, that's, um, okay, I took a photo of that particular map um, at the existing surgeon's quarters in Fort Boise. <laughs> and I'm sure I should be acknowledging the source of the source of the source, but I'm not that good. Um, okay, can't, but I had to throw this part in too. Um, because I mentioned the toll road, the stage road coming from Idaho City, uh, the Boise Basin, and that was the big gold mining. Is that the stage would go down as you hit where all the rhyolite cliffs, there's, you can still pick out these ads that were painted on the rocks. Uh, Joy's Little Liver Pills. Lady's Cloak Jay Brooks has unfortunately had graffiti painted over it now. Um, and you can just barely pick out Coons, Idaho's leading clothier. <laughs> so those are the things. And, you know, this is significant to me because family lore has it that my great uncle was one of the stagecoach drivers. So, <laughs> so that was fun. Anyhow, so as I said before, um, this was one of the gathering sites for many of the tribes. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. And I can't read it as easily. <laughs> I know, but then I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. I can put my glasses on too. Okay. So yes, we'll do it this way. <laughs> Anyhow, so the, the area that I'm getting more of a sense is actually what we now call Barber Valley, would be Peace Valley um, as one translation, but it was a gathering, you know, it was not only a place where the resident tribes would overlap, but where other tribes, members of other tribes would come and they'd have a big annual gathering. Um, unfortunately, this is also, you know, near where Boise started to grow, um, or around the corner. Um, so 1864 Treaty of Fort Boise uh, is when the tribes were forced to sign away their land. However, this treaty was never ratified by Congress. Um, so it's still unceded territory like so many others are. Um, however, as long as the Indians had signed it, the good citizens of Boise said, okay, everybody out now. The reservation they sent them to hadn't been built yet. Um, so there was a several year period where they were confined to um, an encampment in um, the west end of Barber Valley. Um, and uh, over several years under you know, in sufficient conditions, um, probably several hundred, um, you know, some died, I don't know how many. Um, several years later, the survivors were marched to Fort Hall once it had uh, the reservation, once it had been written. Um, and other reservations around the West Duck Valley, splitting up family groups, not one of our better uh, things to be proud of, I'm afraid. Um, okay, so the Fort Boise, was involved in that. I mean, they that was their job. Um, they also were involved in the um, last armed conflict with Native Americans in Idaho. This was a sheep eater conflict in 1879, which the source we had was that it was based on rumors that members of a band were responsible for the murders of several whites and Chinese. Um, generally, there's atrocities on all sides, and it's kind of hard to pick out. Um, the um, anyhow, there was some holdout sheep eater band of Shoshones um, that were pursued by the cavalry for four months through the rugged Idaho mountains before finally surrendering and willing to go to Fort Hall um, reservation. Um, whether you want to call that a war, if it's you know a four month pursuit, um, but just, you know, and on a slightly, we do now have this return of the Boise Valley People's Annual Event, um, which is an annual unity gather of descendants of the diaspora uh, held in Eagle Rock Park, which they got renamed from Quarry View Park, also Gowan Field. So there's some interesting, again, inter connections with the military. Um, a lot of them served, and they honor that during these things um, at the events I've gone to with the motto, still indigenous, still here. So that's my... <laughs> tribute. Um, okay, post frontier Fort Boise. Um, it was na changed to name changed to Boise Barracks in 1879, the same year as the sheep eater conflict. Um, I or Carol found this lovely little quote from Mary Halleck foot uh, was a significant little army post left over from the days of Indian troubles with a half savage white frontier, no longer needed as protection. But Boise wanted as a very good customer that promptly paid its bills and paid to our wires were pulled to keep it there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that kept it going for a few more years. Um, it was an active army post until 1912, um, then National Guard, and um, now it's been repurposed for be kind of split between federal lands and city of Boise lands, um, including the Boise Little Theater. <laughs> Um, is on that, um, the Elks Rehab now, St. Luke's, um, and uh, mostly the veterans area is what we think of, but it has a lot more than that. But just, okay, a little bit about uh, that, but uh, one of the existing buildings that was um, restored in 2014 in collaboration with Preservation Idaho turns out to be the surgeon's quarters, and um, which I just happened to find when I was riding my bike around. And that's where I got the signage of this, some of this stuff from. And this would have been where Wilcox would have been housed 
did his work. <laughs> um, so that was kind of a fun little thing to find. Um, so he was in Boise from 79 to 82, um, accompanied with his wife, Claire, um, 10 year old daughter, one year old son. Uh, and the other son had died at birth uh, or shortly there, or less than four years after. Um, also, he was delegated with providing the daily weather reports, which actually that same book, Nature's Army, really explains why the military was involved in weather reporting. And this is another thing I homed in a little bit more because that meant he would have not only known but interacted with my great grandfather, who was stationed at Fort Boise as the uh, weatherman. So, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, and Wilcox was involved in the sheep eater conflict. Um, there's a journal by a guy named Hoffner that, again, Carol tracked down, um, that describes uh, Robin's return from Boise City with our mail, our post doctor Wilcox, <laughs> two surgeons and two privates, um, had a tough time for three days with nothing to eat but salmon. Um, they had Umatilla Indians, as you know, some Indians were working with them. Um, camped, um, lost four pack mules by falling over a precipice. Another cavalry joined us today with 24 men. We now present a fierce warlike appearance, wash day. <laughs> so these things that go into the, um, and Wilcox is also mentioned as um, examining an injured Indian scout in 1880. So just, oh, and here's something fun. Um, uh, at the Smithsonian is it a basket that was um, apparently donated by Wilcox that was captured from the sheep eaters um, in 1879 at a branch of the Middle Fork. So uh, made from willow apparently. So a little bit of botany in there too. So just one of the items. Um, so plants collected by Wilcox while he was in Idaho. Um, there's at least 76 um, herbarium specimens we could find mostly in the National Herbarium. US is the acronym for the National Herbarium. Uh, and again, two fungi, Ascidium wilcoxianum, Puccinium wilcoxianum. I don't know their current status, uh, but the Elecaria wilcoxii is now Plagiobacter sleptocletus. Um, also, in addition to things that are new, he made the first collection of both Aussie's onion and Boise milk vetch, apparently. Um, they weren't recognized as distinct until quite a ways after him using different types, but uh, that's common. <laughs> uh, but those, those were a couple of things he found. Why he didn't find Mulford's milk fetch, we've been wondering, but <laughs> uh, but those are a couple. Um, this is also interesting that among the specimens he collected that we could track down, there's three that are supposedly from Boise that are, I've never found them here. I don't know of any other specimens other than these ones. Um, the Indian tobacco was one that was cultivated by Indians. Um, or you know, quasi-cultivated. And so it could have been here as long as the Indians were here and then didn't stay. But what uh, the centaur- We had a volunteer uh, tobacco plant out there. Oh, okay. It, it grew and then we thought there'd be more and it hasn't come Okay, and, well, there might be seed bank stuff then. Okay, yeah. well, I need to <laughs> change that. It has been found. <laughs> uh, whether or not the- uh, Packard's cow pie buckwheat was actually here or south of town before it was developed, or if he just happened to collect it going to Silver City trade and on the way back, but called it all Boise. We don't know. Uh, here's the irony. He did make possibly the first collection of Penstemon Wilcoxii, but it got named after a different Wilcox. <laughs> Uh, Vernon, early Vernon Wilcox, a biology professor at University of Montana. So just these little, okay. Now, how about that primrose though? The one that, um, you know, Mary Halleck Foote wondered about and, uh, you know, Boone's label indicated it was named Wilcoxiana and even Bjornsson's flora of Southwestern Idaho used the common name of Wilcoxiana for it. So here's apparently the only place of publication, you know, the only thing that counts as publication. Okay, I get into this stuff. So um, it was in the, a note in the bulletin of the Tory Botanical Club um, by um, the A, B is Addison Brown, who was the editor. Um, I think I do need my glasses. 
If I need him, I know you can't read him back. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's basically, it, you know, it's acknowledging Wilcox for this gift of plants that was sent. Um, and then kind of he just goes through some of the stuff. Okay. He mentions that Professor Wood regarded this as a variety of Primula peri, I named it variety Wilcoxiana. Okay. But there is no publication that we found by Wood in which this was published. This is only the thing. Now it almost qualifies because it does have some diagnostic characters. You know, it gives the number of flowers, how it differs from the other things. It indicates specimens indirectly. I mean, these are Wilcox collections from Boise. So those are two of the critical things for a valid publication. However, I ran this by the nomenclature guru um, at Harvard, Kanchi Gandhi. And he says, nope, it doesn't actually provide the combination names. It, you know, it says, uh, you know, kind of, well, Wood was calling it perii, but then he goes off into angustifolia. Um, so we never actually see what combination of species name and then variety is being intended. And then at the end, he says, it is possibly a distinct species. The author has to be certain, you know, committed to, yes, this is new. So uh, technicalities, Sorry, Wilcoxiana has never been validly published. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> On the other hand, it's still in flux. Um, the whole idea, you know, this is one of the groups that's getting work. Um, you know, so if you look in vas the old vascular plants of Pacific Northwest, that mentions a variety of Cusiciana, uh, Broadheadii, and Broadheadii var minor. Um, and in the Intermountain Flora, there's three more varieties added just to make it even more fun. Um, and then there's work done by this guy in um, Kuntz, a uh, grad student recently, um, and talked with Don, who's been working, Man Mansfield's been working on it. And he says, okay, there's very little morphological things we've been able to tease up, but there do seem to be even within Kosikiana, without those Nevada and Utah things, um, three or maybe four different ecogeographic groups with some genetic distinction. Clay flats in northeastern Oregon and Jason Idaho around the foothills of the Wallawas, mostly. And that's the original Kosikiana that Kusik collected. Then there's the stuff that's on north facing loamy slopes in the Boise and Payette River drainages. This is the Wilcoxiana. And then there's another one that's on scab lands with Coa Libergii that grows from the Wood River, Camas Prairie. Um, and Don says it's all same thing, same habitat above 6,000 feet in the Waihi and Malheur counties. And that would include the Broadheadii. Um, and then Kuhn says, oh, there's also some even different stuff in the high garbage. So, uh, you know, we may have four different things, even, I don't know. Anyhow, <laughs> I just had to throw in that it's still not settled. <laughs> um, a side note on Primula Broadheadii, because once Carol gets going, she can't stop. <laughs> uh, so she had to track down who's this broadhead that this uh, other one's named after from Ketchum. And so it's the wife of a mining engineer, Eliza Avery. She's only referred to in the local papers as Mrs. W.H. Broadhead. Uh, but we find out that she prepared plant, Idaho plants for exhibits, um, exhibitions in New Orleans and Chicago, um, which even I think it says the governor Sharp, Shoop, Idaho's commissioner, um, was the one who took them to the New Orleans one. So she was very well known, you know, uh, for Idaho plants at the time. So obviously more to find out. Okay, so just a little bit on the status of Wilcoxiana in the Boise front. Um, okay, Wilcox collected it from the Boise barracks. Was it actually on the flats? I mean, I don't know of any population still extant anywhere close to Fort Boise. I mean, there was a tiny one near where I was on Horizon Drive. It's winked out as far as I can tell. It's not doing well. I mean, there's still a few populations, but I say they're declining. Um, and even this Bjornsson in 1946 says, um, 
People who lived here in the early 1900s tell us that in spring, the foothills used to be a massive color with these flowers. Surely this is a flower that needs protection. One has to hunt for it nowadays. And this was back in 1946, she was saying this. And like I said, it's still probably in decline, like so many other things. Okay, but it wasn't just plants that Wilcox collected. Now that I bored you with the technical details of primroses because I'm a taxonomist. <laughs> Um, some of his other natural history contributions, he donated mule deer antlers and Western European house mice. It was easy to get pictures of mule deer antlers from Carol. <laughs> um, and he begins publishing short natural history articles. And this is, gets kind of fun. His first one that we can find, Intellect and in Brutes, is about the habits of red or agricultural ants and the small black ant, uh, presumably harvest ants. And rather than trying to read this, I'm just taking out a few of the choice nuggets. Uh, this burrows are said to be very deep, always extending to water. I'm guessing it doesn't mean water, but moist soil down into the moisture. The fighting's all done by the warriors who on being called to the sentry. It's very militaristic as you expect by somebody in the army. Um, oh, but this is interesting. Um, one of his hospital stewards has observed that these ants render much service by freeing houses of that insect pest so common in warm climates, um, bed bugs. Maybe we he just sent a whole bunch of harvester ants to Paris. <laughs> okay. Oh, he also notes that worms, earthworms, are not native to Boise. I mean, this is not the only source we know of that, but he confirms, yeah. I mean, they were brought here by some enthusiastic disciples of Isaac Walton, I mean, members of the Fisherman Isaac Walton League or whatever who successfully reared the coveted bait for the fish hooks. So that's where we have earthworms in Boise. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, he talks about uh, introduced game birds, um, and especially the bobwhite quail, um, successfully introduced into Boise Valley, Idaho. Um, well, let's see, I've never saw coveys so large or numerous as I found them about Boise. I mean, I remember a few bobwhite growing up, but I haven't seen them in a long time. Mountain quail, but native. Yeah, uh, but they're gone too. <laughs> but so are Bob White. We got California quail now. <laughs> um, okay, so some more observations on game birds, this case grouse. Um, he calls them, um, mostly referring to sooty grouse, but I think those would probably be, coincide with dusky grouse now in Idaho. Um, but, okay, he was in Lake Chillon, Washington, so we know he was there uh, talking about large coveys um, and heard for the first time the call note of the female to her young, so just little observations. Oh, I did point out in that first article on ants that that was published in Nature. Nature obviously had a much lower bar back then than it does now. <laughs> And, uh, you know, talk about going to Indian Valley, riding past and, you know, being able to reach out with a switch or whatever. So uh, they were earning their name fool hens back then. Um, but this was kind of a fun little note too, and a, yet a slightly different. Um, caught an old grouse with my fish hook. Um, that the, Had the rod on my shoulder and suddenly upon a covey, caught one with my hand, you know, caught one of the young ones with his hands, which made the old bird so frantic, she attacked me lighted on my rod, the hook cursed her foot, and she ran off with the, <laughs> uh, but the leader broke and she flew off, but she still had the hook in her foot, so. <laughs> oh, this was unusual. I mean, just all these, all this, you know, wide observations that he would make on so many different topics, but the idea that cowboys in Idaho's treatment for local weed poisoning, you amputate the tails of the animals that's affected. And they say it works. Okay. <laughs> of course, they can't tell Larkspur from uh, <laughs> Stragulus either. So, Oh, and this is the surprise. Condors in Idaho. Apparently, there'd been um, at least five Euro American sightings at condors, going back to Lewis and Clark. Um, Wilcox's was only the last. And this is um, in a presentation to... Um, the meeting of the Biological Society of Washington after he'd retired, and that he was requested to record, as has been doubted, the occurrence of the California vulture condors in Idaho. 
Um, and he says, you saw them in 1879, much larger than turkey buzzers, with which I am quite familiar and was very close to them, so I could not be mistaken in their identity. So, I mean, I would trust that this, <laughs> he knew what he was talking about based on his other astute observations. So going into some of the, you know, this is just part of the short article, but going to where, what, where's this sighting? And he says, in the Boise River Mountains rise to over 7,000 feet just back of where the vultures were feeding. The exact locality was near the hot spring above Boise City. Now this makes me think of Warm Springs Natatorium, but it's more likely that at this time, it was Kelly Hot or what has been called Kelly Hot Springs um, on, has a whole bunch of other names, but that's the one that's on the interpretive signage in the green belt at the west end of Barber Valley. Um, and apparently the main hot spring long before the natatorium and stuff was developed was um, around the corner um, on the backside of Table Rock and Warm Springs Mesa. Um, and this is also where the Native Americans had been interred before being marched off to the uh, reservations. Um, it was commercialized as a resort in 1870, i.e. the year after the Indians were marched off. Um, burned down several times, finally not rebuilt. Uh, quite the story of it uh, having to do with uh, it being not just a hot springs, but a kind of exclusive club that probably had, could have had uh, liquor prostitution during the uh, prohibition. And that might have been why it kept getting burned down. And <laughs> um, there's hardly any evidence of it. I think it's where probably where Starcrest Drive goes up on the backside, perhaps. It's really difficult to, well, I'm sure somebody knows, can say, oh yeah, it was right here, but I haven't got to that point yet. <laughs> and so what killed the condors? Ta -da! The cattlemen said that that was not uncommon before they began to poison carcasses to kill wolves. Surprise. <laughs> um, poison and population and now destroyed that far north habitat. Okay, so how so much for Boise on to one of his next postings in Fort Niobrara, Nebraska, um, which fort was established in 1880. It's now a wildlife refuge. Um, among the things that uh, Wilcox found a ship off to Smithsonian was mammoth fossils and uh, extinct pronghorn relative, uh, 40 collections of birds, and at least 85 plant collections, with most of those going to New York. Um, some of the plants um, they, uh, based on his collections is uh, Galpensia interior, uh, which is an uh, Onagraceae, and Panicum wilcoxianum, which is still named after him, but in the genus Dicanthelium now. Um, then on to Fort Huachuca, or maybe with some other postings in between, <laughs> uh, but at least 1892 to 94. Um, so Fort Huachuca was a cavalry camp, uh, first established in 1877, then became a permanent fort, um, declared a National Historic Landmark in 1976, and one of the only frontier forts still in active use. Um, this is one of his most productive and um, best documented of his postings, um, with over um, 1,200 database specimens, um, 17 types. Um, which are summer, a lot of which is summarized in Britain Wilk Kearney's um, enumeration of plants collected by Wilcox during this time. Um, so there's Berberus Wilcoxii there. What's the color thing for? Oh, the color thing on a herbarium specimen is to correct for any color change that might have taken place during the digitizing, because then you can go and recorrect according to the color plate and make sure that you get the original coloration. We're not doing, I'm not bothering doing that with the fossils. <laughs> Color isn't quite as critical. <laughs> um, okay, and this, this is another where Wilcox now intersects with Mulford <laughs> that Carol worked on um, because apparently he, I don't think they ever met. There's no evidence that they met or that uh, Mulford actually came to um, Arizona. Um, she was the first student to earn, again, I'm pulling this out of uh, Carol's research. She was the first student to earn a PhD at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, she collected extensively in Southwest Idaho in 1892, which was 10 years after Wilcox's departure. 
Uh, she did overlap foot. They went out in the field together at least once. Um, she has Mulford's milk fetch named after her. She's also the one who described white um, Fraser in Montana. Her dissertation, however, was on agave, um, since that was her major advisor's special, one of them. Um, but in that, she credits Wilcox for his assistance and uses several of his photos. Um, she notes the value of his habit photos. So he was getting into photography. Who knows how many photos we could... Oh, Rusty Russell says that he has at least one collection book at Smithsonian, so okay. <laughs> um, also, he notes um, which agave species the cows will eat. Okay. And uh, I have to point out, or do you want to point out the picture? Oh, the, that is a black uh, sergeant standing by the agave. Yeah, I mean, this is where the buffalo soldiers were based before they went off to work in Yosemite, which is covered in this too. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm also curious, though, did Wilcox ever meet John and Sarah Lemon? Um, which some of you hopefully have already heard, a uh, very well-known couple uh, for people who are into botanical history in California. Um, let's see, this is mostly, yeah, Lemon, by the way, was a survivor of the Confederate prison at Andersonville, so he would have had that. Um, but they did their honeymoon in Arizona <laughs> um, and kept going back a few times. Um, the Wilcox wasn't in Arizona uh, for their 1882 trip when they were actually based at Fort Huachuca. Um, and when they did a trip 10 years later, um, they were mostly in the Chiricahua Mountains. But there's at least one collection, one um, with some multiple duplicates that some of them say that Wilcox was the collector and some say that Lemon was the collector. Same date, same location. So there's a good chance they went into the Huachuca Mountains during that time. So that's kind of fun just because the lemons are cool. Lemon, uh, P, or Mount Lemon outside of Tucson is named after Sarah Lemon, which is always fun to know. So... <laughs> Uh, and I also love this particular passage from that that I got from that book, um, talking where the lemons describe what it was like traveling um, and collecting plants through Arizona at the time that you know the Apaches were on the warpath, uh, you know all these Indian troubles as we call them. And they say, you know, we went around there. We never had anything more warlike than our little sheath knife in our hands, you know up and down, rocky caverns all over the place, and met Indians um, and never had any warlike action from them. Instead, um, they would be surprised to see a man and woman walking side by side. They called us medicine men, would follow us miles and bring their arms full of bulbs and plants. Then we were able to give us the Indian names for the medicine plants we might have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a very different interaction by crazy botanists wandering around. <laughs> Um, just for snippets of his subsequent career, um, let's see, he was a lieutenant colonel chief surgeon in Spanish-American War. We can wonder, was he with the Rough Riders? Who knows? <laughs> uh, honorably discharged, but as Carol points out, he probably got re-enlisted then because um, he was at least on an inspection tour of hospital service and sanitary condition of military posts in Alaska and retires as a brigadier general. So he did pretty good. Uh, one interesting donation from Alaska that Carol tracked down was these uh, fossil bison skull, um, which was on the cabin roof um, of some minor you know, cabin along uh, near Rampart. Um, and he said, oh, can we get that and send it off to Smithsonian and got permission and shipped all these horns off to the Smithsonian where they've been uh, the most perfect pair of horns of this kind ever found in Alaska, at least at the time. <laughs> so that's kind of, uh, he got around. <laughs> um, so his retirement years, again, just running through, you know, he remained an active members of the Biological Society of Washington, Cosmos Club, National Geographic Society. Um, collect, still kept collecting, got a puffball pipe from Rock Creek Park. <laughs> uh, 
Um, got a cactus named after him in his honor. Um, he fi his final note that we could find a year after he was he was nearly blind from 1917, but his mind was clear to the end. Uh, but the following year, you know, the note read by the secretary on the inability of camels to swim. Uh, still plugging away there and made a life member at the Tory Botanical Club in 1930. Um, and I'll let Carol have the last one here. <laughs> Her picture, by the way, from Arlington. So, so I did run into a, uh, just by random chance, a video on on the internet of these camels that are swam across this <laughs> this ocean divide to this island where they eat the mangrove, and then they have to swim them back because there's no fresh water in the island. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two truths and a lie, I guess. <laughs> I think they were one. <laughs> so uh, he died in 32 at the age of 92. He was buried in Arlington. His wife had had died. They they went to Cuba, and I. She she got sick and she died soon after that and was buried at her hometown, but she's evidently been reinterred in Arlington. And also uh, their two children are buried in Arlington also. And this is uh, just, if you're at the tomb of the unknown soldier, it's at the bottom of the hill from, from there that his grave is. Uh, he had a... Uh, a clinic named after him in 1980. So he was still well revered by the military at that time. It's no longer a clinic now, but I was able to find the the plaque that they had put on the building. And uh, that was one of the early finds. Jim Grimes found that oh, really? back in the day. So, and is that the last one? I think so. Yeah. So. <laughs> We've, we've done the tour. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Do you think Premier Level Cox had a good speaking this time? Well, Dr. Packard tells me they smell different, the different ones. So, more research. More research. Is there any chance of people trying to reintroduce the uh, the primrose uh, to, where? to the region? Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm thinking here. Or has it gotten too warm down here? Oh, you don't have to have to on camera, but it'll be pretty here. That question of whether the primrose could be reintroduced, and it's not disappeared completely, it's just in decline. It's much easier to just maybe slow down declines and reverse them rather than reintroduce. <laughs> so how long did Mohawk actually in Idaho? I think you probably said, but you went over a lot of things. Two or three years? Two or three years, okay. Yeah. Wow. Carol, what's your favorite thing? Uh, I was hoping you would say uh, Oh. <laughs> Russ mentions how are we introducing condors? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was so ironic because I thought I was all done researching and I had to go back and find a reference and that popped up when I was searching for the reference. Again. Like, what? Okay. Um, actually, I understand the nest curse are uh, trying to get condors uh, introduced into um, Hell's Canyon. Oh, wow. Wow. I could have put that in. Uh, so... Wilcox was in Fort Boise, June 1879 to August 1882. So that's 82. 
So about three years. <laughs> he was busy. Yeah, he was, he was, did a lot. <laughs> In between throwing off a few times. Okay. Thank you. Don't be. 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 Don't be.